Good morning, Valley Church. I am excited to welcome you to the service today as we're going to enter into a time of worship. And as we do, um, very excited to be able to sing about the welcoming of our Lord as Jesus entered into this world. Um, we can sing and we can shout and we can just echo his praises around this world and the people among us. So as we go into our first song of praise and worship, I just ask that we would turn our eyes and our hearts and everything that we are towards him who's uh, worthy of all praise. Let's sing together.
as we continue our time of worship, we're going to move into a time of offering and giving. Um, giving is available at our website online. Um, but let's go to our Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, you are the giver of good gifts. And you have given us more, infinitely more than we could ever deserve. So as you've been generous, um, we ask that you turn our hearts to become generous as well and that we would find so much joy in the opportunity that we have to give our offerings back towards you. And we know that you're gonna use them for your glory. So we give these to you. Pray this in Jesus' name, amen.
shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Good morning, Valley Church, and welcome to our Palm Sunday service. I invite you to open in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 21. We'll be looking at the first 11 verses. This is an amazing tale, uh, one that has captured the thoughts and imaginations of people throughout the centuries. And it reminds me of another story of a hidden king and a group of desperate followers having a battle at the gate of a city. If you're thinking like I am, you're thinking about Lord of the Rings, the return of the king, where Aragorn is, is preparing for battle with his group outside the Black Gate. Well, those stories are very, very similar, but they're also very different. You see, Jesus isn't riding a battle-hardened stallion. No, he's riding a donkey that's never been ridden before. It's not a sword in his hand. That's his symbol of authority, but palm branches being waved by his followers. It's not a battle cry that erupts from the lips of his followers, but, but it's a cry for him to save them. And probably the biggest difference of all is that at the end of this battle, this King Jesus will die at the hands of the people of this city and all hope will be lost. Ah, but all hope is not lost because Jesus is no ordinary king. The events of the last week of Jesus are leading us up to our, our, the high point of all the Christian calendar, and that is of Good Friday and of Easter. This journey is, a tw is set with twists and turns of highs and lows and a deepening understanding of who Jesus really is. You see, Jesus and his disciples had begun their trip to Jerusalem from Galilee. And on Friday night, they stopped at Bethany, a little village just to the east of Jerusalem. That's where they stayed with their friends Lazarus and Mary and Martha, three siblings who had uh, committed themselves to, to the, the ministry of Jesus. And whenever he was in the area, they would, he would stay there and, and live in their home. And the Friday night that's, that's uh, been before this, Mary anoints Jesus' feet, John chapter 12 tells us, with costly perfume. On Saturday, Jesus keeps the Sabbath in his tradition with his friends. And now it's Sunday morning. The triumphal entry is recorded in all four Gospels. It's his last major public appearance before his crucifixion. And Jesus at this moment is presenting himself to the nation as no ordinary king. In fact, not even an ordinary Messiah that they had in mind. No, something far greater. Now, how does he do this? Well, we'll see this journey that he takes from Bethany through Bethpage and then on into the city. We, we, we have... Um, uh, are familiar with the layout of Jerusalem. You have the temple, the Temple Mount, the old city behind. Now today, obviously, there's much more to this city. It's just a, a couple of miles from Bethany into Jerusalem. So Jesus would stay there at night and then, and then come on in. We'll see Beth Page is figuring prominently in this as well. We had the opportunity to visit this area. Here's Val and I standing in the Garden of Gethsemane. We're looking through the Kidron Valley and back onto the Temple Mount. Of course, the temple was destroyed in 70 AD, and so now the Dome of the Rock is there with the gold just behind my head, and the uh, al Asqua Mosque is here on the other side. We, we know that that place in uh, the world has received more attention and more energy, more news cycles than maybe any place else on earth over the centuries. Well, why is that? Because Jesus 
was no ordinary king. This is no ordinary set of events. This is not just one leader that rises up and then is cast down. No, this is an amazing and unique event. So what is Jesus doing? Well, verses 1 through 8, we'll see that Jesus wants people, everyone, to see who he really is. Beginning in chapter 21, verse 1. Now, when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethpage, Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives, and then Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what is written by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you. Humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. And the disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. And they brought them, the donkey and the colt, and put, them, put on them their cloaks, and he said, as he sat on them. And most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Now, we may be familiar with this story, but there's some of the geography here that really makes this very interesting. You see, the Mount of Olives was 300 feet higher than the highest point in Jerusalem. If you looked at the picture there, we're actually looking down onto the Temple Mount from the Mount of Olives. The Garden of Gethsemane is, is fairly low, but the Mount of Olives goes further on back. And as Jesus and his entourage are coming, they'll be coming down into the city. Not only is it a great view for him coming into the city, it's a great view of the city of them seeing him coming. It sounds funny when he says, well, go to uh, the town that's coming up and let them know, hey, by the way, I'm, I'm taking your donkey. But uh, it, it, Mark adds, and tell them we'll bring it right back. <laughs> And in fact, uh, and Luke says that the owners did ask, hey, what's going on here? So it's the idea that maybe this was a follower of Jesus who was, was making this donkey available. You see, the ride on the donkey was a deliberate act of revelation by Jesus. He really wanted people to see. Look at verse 4. It says, now this took place in order to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. Now, this comment was put in by Matthew later on as he looked back on what had happened. How do I know that? Well, because John chapter 12, verses 16 and 17 lets us know that the disciples didn't understand at first. They, they, they didn't see how all these things fit together. But when Jesus was glorified, they remembered the things that were written of him uh, that they had done. The prophet Zechariah, 500 years before this event happened, predicted that Jerusalem would welcome a king coming in on a donkey. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. That's a phrase used throughout the scriptures for the, the city of Jerusalem. Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and endowed with salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey, even a colt the foal of a donkey. That was common uh, in the Roman world. Of course, when a king would come in after battle, he would come in in a grand procession, leading behind him the, 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 the prisoners and bringing the, the loot that he had taken. This was a, a common idea for a returning and conquering king. And so Jesus is letting it be known that he is fulfilling this prophetic um, uh, word about him as the Messiah. This act of self-disclosure is lifting any veil of secrecy. Jesus was blatantly declaring the truth about himself. And in, in the face of the Pharisees, who had already declared that they would try to kill him. And so, again, why is that? Because Jesus wants people everywhere to see who he really is. And, and what did the People do. They understood the metaphor. They understood what was happening. And again, in symbolic way, verse 8, they began to lay down their garments in acknowledgement of Jesus. Second Kings chapter 9, verse 13, we see this act of 
royal honor. There is a, 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 a metaphor, there was a, a, a sense of symbolism that this is what you do when you're in the, the presence of royalty. I remember several years ago, we had a president of the United States and vice president of the United States who came to the Bay Area, and I stood on a street corner for about 45 minutes just waiting for this limousine to drive by. And, and Valerie was saying, let's go, let's go, let's go. But I, I had never seen a, a president before. Now, I, I didn't take off my jacket and lay it down in front uh, when uh, President Cl Clinton and uh, Mr. Gore drove by, but, but I was still pretty excited about that moment. And uh, I remember seeing just a glimpse uh, of that uh, silver hair as it went by. And uh, wow, I've seen a president. That's the same idea here. Um, what else did they do? Well, it says they were cutting branches from trees. Mark uh, tells us they were leafy trees. John tells us they were palms of trees. Well, again, why is that? That was a, a known symbol. Uh, historians tell us that a hundred years before, um, this happened, that the Maccabeans had dedicated the temple and that palms were used. It was kind of a symbol of national pride, like we have a bald eagle or, or from sea to shining sea and these kinds of things. Well, for them, it was a palm tree. And so this biblical tradition shows that, that, that they're waving these palms. It's, it's like they're singing Hail to the Chief or, or something like that. These Visible symbols, the donkey, the clothes being laid down, the palms were, were all ways for people to see who Jesus is. Jesus wants people to see. So the question then might be, do we want people to see who Jesus really is? And how do we do that in an environment that doesn't really recognize these symbols? Jesus on a donkey. Well, that wouldn't mean anything. To most people today, they'd say, well, I guess he was tired and didn't want to walk, right? <laughs> you know, two mile, a two-mile walk. I think he was just too tired. No, that's not the case. Um, what other reasons might there be? Well, what, we're, what we need to see then is, well, how do we display who Jesus is to a watching world? How do we make that happen? Well, let me suggest a couple of things. Remember when Jesus healed the blind men. What he said was, I don't know all this fancy religious stuff, but here's what I know. I once was blind, but now I see. Your personal story, your personal testimony of, of a changed life can be the most powerful witness, the most powerful testimony, the most powerful thing that, that will talk about who Jesus is. If you remember last week, we were talking in, in 1 Peter chapter 3, and Glenn reminded us where Peter's words about disobedient husbands being won over by their wives without a word. How does that happen? It's because there's a quality of life, there's a transformation that happens when Jesus invades our lives. The Holy Spirit begins to take over. And that way of showing who Christ is what he means, the reality of the resurrection, all come through your changed life. The other thing that's like that I thought of, again, comes from our study in, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 12. Peter talks about these acts of sacrifice, these good lives that we live among the pagans, even though they accuse us of doing wrong, that they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. To live a life like Jesus, to love people, to heal the sick, to feed the hungry, to care for the poor. These are ways that we validate the person of Jesus through our actions. I like this little phrase that, that somebody said. I've heard it several, from several places. Doing good deeds for people leads to goodwill and opens the door for hearing the good news. To put it another way, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. The reason people follow Jesus, as we'll see in just a moment here, is because he had showed his love and compassion to them through acts of great generosity, of, of healing uh, the leper, of 
caring for the, for the woman with the issue of blood, of raising Lazarus from the grave. These are all ways that Jesus showed he cared. So who are you going to show Jesus to this Easter? Now notice I didn't say, who are you going to tell? I said, who are you going to show by your acts of kindness, by your generosity? What are you going to do to tell? And how does show and tell go together? You could probably remember a time in elementary school when you got to do show and tell. I, I heard about one of our elementary school kids who was invited to do show and tell in their public school classroom, and she decided to show and tell about the meaning of Easter. And her teacher let her. This is wonderful. How do these things go together? And what is easier, to show or to tell? Well, I imagine it's probably easier to tell. We can talk a good talk. But does the quality of our life, does the transformation of our character go along with that? You've probably heard Francis of Assisi misquoted to say, preach the gospel at all times. If po uh, use words if necessary. <clears throat> but this quote does not show up in any of his writings. It's not even close. What Francis did say was that your deeds should match your words. So how do we do that? How do we go from just seeing who he is to hearing who he is? Well, Jesus has that same passion. He wants everyone not only to see, but to hear who he is. Look at verse 9. The crowds that went ahead of him and those who followed shouted, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Well, who were these crowds that went before and went behind? We know from John chapter 12, verse 17, that, that they were people who were following him because of his great miracles, these signs that he had done. It says there was a great multitude of them. It says, for this reason also the people went to meet him because they heard that he had performed this sign of raising Lazarus from the dead. So the Pharisees said to one another, you see that you're not doing any good. Look, the world has gone out after him. This was no small disturbance. This wasn't just a couple of guys following along behind Jesus as, as he came down the hill uh, into the city off the Mount of Olives on a donkey. No, this was a multitude. Crowds of people had been following him all the way through this journey. What are they saying? Well, they're basically saying Psalm 118. This is part of the Hallel, that, that, that song of ascent that was used as they would, as the people of Israel would come into Jerusalem for the Passover. Psalm 118, verse 24. This is the day which the Lord has made. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Lord, do save, we beseech you. And in, in Aramaic, that would be Hosanna. That's the Hosanna place. Lord, we beseech you, do send prosperity. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. The crowd actually put some additions onto this psalm. They use this term, son of David, the most common messianic term. They'd wrapped up all of these things together and they'd said, this is clearly who Jesus is. In fact, John adds that the crowd adds even the king of Israel, not part of Psalm 118, but showing their hopes and dreams. So the people are traveling with Jesus and, they, and, the, and the people come out of the city of Jerusalem and they begin to praise him. And Jesus lets them. See, these people were coming because they were, they were tired of Roman oppression. They were, they were hungry for a, a political liberator. They wanted a freedom. They wanted to restore God's chosen people to, uh, to, to their rightful place as God's favorite ones. And some thought, well, look, this guy's amazing. He gave us bread. He heals our diseases. Yeah, let's go ahead and make him king. And remember, when they tried to do that in, in, in early in the book of John, he said, no, 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 my kingdom is not of this world. And they didn't hear it. 
They still had those aspirations. In fact, the disciples even had got caught up in that excitement, the celebrity. Wow, the world is looking at this. Have you ever been in a crowd like that? Where there's this spontaneous, there's this uh, enthusiasm, there's this momentum that's rolling. You're around someone who's famous or, or something exciting is happening. It's intoxicating. And the disciples were right there with them. Maybe you've been in the presence of a celebrity one time and, and you've kind of said, wow, look at this person. Uh, and, 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 you know, maybe went up and said hello or gotten an autograph or something like that. We were sitting in an uh, airport in Brazil and I looked behind me and, and there was a famous movie star sitting right behind me in the, in the airport lounge. And uh, I said to Val, I said, hey, honey, that's, that's so-and-so. She said, no, it's not. And I said, yeah, it is. I guarantee it is. I, I, I got a thing for remembering faces. That, I, that's who it is. And then pretty soon her, my, her sister-in-law came over and, and she went around and said, yeah, it's her, it's her, it's her. And I said, oh, yeah, okay, whatever. We'll leave her be. Well, you know, pretty soon a crowd gathered around her and people were asking her for her autograph. And she was, she was actually really quite ill, and, uh, but, but very kind and gracious. And, and there was that buzz of a crowd around a celebrity. That's exactly what was happening. The people of Jerusalem went out and, and, they, and they tried to, 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 to catch some of that celebrity while they were there. And we're not talking about a small number of people anyway. Normally, the population of Jerusalem at this uh, stage in history would be about 50,000 people. But for Passover, it would swell to 120,000 so the place was packed, and then there's this even bigger group coming in. So the group coming, and then all the city of Jerusalem, they go, what's going on? Let's, let's go find out what's happening. So what is it that these people wanted? Well, they wanted a liberator. Maybe they just wanted lunch. You know, they had heard about the fishes and loaves. So they're thinking, I can get a free meal out of this. Maybe they were just curious or bored or tired or angry or hurting Maybe they were just looking out for their own self-centered needs. But Jesus allows them to praise him. In fact, the, the, the Pharisees say, tell your disciples to stop saying what they're saying. And Jesus said, I tell you, if these become silent, the stones will cry out. So it's right to give him praise. It's right to bring our needs before him. Do you know that, that Jesus accepts you at your starting point of need. If you're afraid, if you're uncertain about the future, if you're worried about your kids suffering physically, suffering mentally, suffering emotionally, if you're bored, lonely, lost, just walked in off the street, just got served with divorce papers, just got out of jail, just watched your 401 tank, whatever your situation is, Jesus will receive you as you are. I just talked on the phone with my friend Dave Carlson, pastor of Neighborhood Bible Church. You know, when we started that church, we had this phrase. We said, come as you are, but don't stay that way. That the invitation of Jesus to come, and as we're going to talk about on Easter, to lay our burdens down and to be transformed by him is that beautiful invitation that this is talking about. But you know, it has to go beyond seeing and hearing. Look at verse 10. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? And the crowd answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. After all that he'd said, after all that he'd done, after all the signs, there's no record of anyone saying, This is Jesus, the Messiah. No, he was just a prophet among many other prophets. Luke chapter 19 tells us that in the, in the middle of this celebration that kind of had an energy and a, a life of its own, Jesus at the center of it pulled off to the side. And the scripture says that when he approached the city, he saw it and wept over it. Why? Because he says, you did not recognize the time of your visitation. Jesus knew he was headed for the cross. 
And in a few short days, that this, these same mouths that had cried, Hosanna, Hosanna, would be the same ones that would cry, crucify, crucify. Judas would betray him. His best friends would deny him. The multitudes would call for his death. What could make for such a change as that? Well, one commentator put it this way. He was not at that time intended to come in earthly splendor or to reign in earthly power. He was not to come in wealth, but in poverty. He did not come in grandeur, but in meekness. He did not come to slay Israel's, mankind, Israel's enemies, but to save all of mankind. He did not come to conquer Rome, but to conquer sin and death. He did not come to make war with Rome, but to make peace between God and man. No, he did not come with a sword. He came to die. Jesus recognized the necessity of the cross. It's so easy for us, like the crowd, to focus on our needs, what we want, what we need, and what, what we want, and when we want it. We want the triumphal entry. We want the, the, the bright and shine of Easter Sunday morning, but we forget the cross and the grave. Jesus wants to take us beyond the extent of our own wants to recognize our real need, a restored relationship with God through Jesus, the Son. All the answers to our needs are met in the cross. You see, there is no Christ without cross. There is no Easter without Good Friday, without the pain of Calvary. And yet the invitation that Jesus is, as put by the Apostle Paul, Whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. And notice that, that, that Paul even goes on to talk about this showing and telling, but beyond that to believing. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how will they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? And how will they preach unless they are sent? So faith comes from hearing. And hearing by the word of God. That progression of an, of an inward hunger, an inward desire, a desire a, 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 and a, a process of hearing the gospel and understanding and seeing it lived out in a way that makes sense to say, that is what I need. That is what I see. That is what I long for. We do this on his terms, not on our terms. Jesus said it this way, if anyone wishes to be my disciple, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life shall lose it. Whoever wishes to come, whoever wishes to lose his life for my sake is the one who will save it. You know, a poll in Newsweek magazine <clears throat> said that 78% of Americans believe Jesus rose from the dead. 75% said that he was sent to earth to absolve mankind from all of their sins. If that's true, they've seen and heard a version of Jesus that, that may have witnessed some event. They may have heard a TV preacher someplace, but they've never connected that idea of faith, of trust, of calling out to him for Christ. Is it possible we've misrepresented Jesus as someone that's enough to just see and hear, but not to believe, to not take up our cross, to not die to ourselves so that we might live for him? Have we gotten complacent enough that we can cry out, Hosanna, to, to in the day of celebration, but will disappear on the day of testing? Are we willing to show Jesus by actions? Or have we forgotten that part of the gospel? Are we willing to tell about Jesus with words, but not to show him? 
According to a Newsweek poll, Americans, 78% of Americans believe that Jesus rose from the dead. 75% say that he was sent to earth to absolve mankind of its sins. So people have seen and heard, but have they really known and understood? Is it possible that somehow we've represented Jesus in such a way that you can have these intellectual um, uh, ideas about him, but have never turned over our hearts and lives to take up our cross, to follow him, to live a sacrificial life? Is it possible we've modeled that to the world around us? Is it possible that we're willing to show Jesus by being good, loving, moral people but are not willing to or are afraid to tell them the reason why. That our good deeds and good works are because of the good love of Christ that's been shown to us. Maybe on the other hand, we've been willing to tell people about Jesus, but not display any of the love and the care and the kind of, of, of transformed heart and life to them. That, that Jesus did to the people that he loved and cared about. Now the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey was a declaration that Jesus wanted all of that to happen. And we can thank him for showing that in our life and to take advantage of this Easter season to let people know, to show and to tell that they might believe. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for revealing yourself to us through a caring friend or family member or, or through your word and in prayer, Lord. We know that you use all kinds of ways to draw people to yourself. Help us to show, out of a heart of gratitude for what you've done for us, the transforming power of the gospel. Help us to tell, to be ready to give an answer for the hope that's within us and for the reason for any good deed. And Lord, we trust that as we do that, you will draw people to yourself and many will come to faith in Christ. And we pray this in his name, amen. You know, one of the ways we show our faith in Christ is through communion. And our Lord Jesus gave us this um, ceremony, this experience of a way of both um, showing and telling the good news of the gospel. And maybe you need to take a moment to collect uh, the bread and the cup as you prepare to celebrate communion there with your family, with those you're watching with. But as we've talked about this Palm Sunday and these, these two elements of, of our need and then also of our faith to not only see Christ, to hear about him, but then to believe. And so we'll demonstrate these things through the bread and through the cup that Jesus gave to us uh, on the night he was betrayed. And he reminded us of how important they were for us and to remember him and his sacrifice on our behalf. The Apostle Paul put it this way, the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had um, given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And Lord, with this bread... We pause and remember how much we need you. Lord, your life, death, burial, and resurrection met the needs of the human heart. Take just a moment right now and express your need to the Lord Jesus. Your heart, the cry of your heart, that empty space that him coming in fills Go ahead and acknowledge that before the Lord in these moments. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Scripture also then tells us that in the same way, take the cup. And as Jesus did after supper and saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink of it in remembrance of me. Let's drink this cup together. And let's pray. Lord, this is a cup of celebration. And so by faith, we acknowledge and celebrate what you did on the cross. What you did by rising from the grave. And what you're doing uh, in our hearts and lives today. And Lord, by faith, what you will do one day when you return. Thanks for meeting our need. Thanks for constantly being there when we need you. Thank you for this reminder, the bread and the cup. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let me remind you about a few things that are going on. Of course, uh, you're watching online right now, but we want to invite you to come. If you're able, maybe you've had a vaccine, you're ready to join us at our outdoor services Sundays at 10.45 a.m., beautiful weather, beautiful chance to meet together with God's people out on the grass. That will include a Good Friday service outdoors. We also have this online at valleychurch.org, so we invite you to join us in either of those two places. Reservations or um, sign-in is required for us, so we uh, invite you to come online, do that online, and uh, we'll be happy to see you then in person when we do that. And again, Easter is coming up. So uh, maybe you've been waiting for a chance to, to join with us in person. Uh, Easter Sunday morning at 1045 would be great. Of course, our services will still be online as well. And then as a way of follow-up, maybe you have a friend or maybe you're somebody who's asking questions about the faith. We're going to be running an online alpha course starting Tuesdays on April 6th. And we'd love to have you join us. That'll be at 7 p.m. And uh, Frank Chen is going to be running that. So I hope you'll take advantage of those things. God bless you this week as you go. Remember, Jesus is no ordinary king. Remember, when he comes the next time, it's not going to be on the foal of a donkey. No, Scripture tells us he will come in all of his glory on a white horse with a sword. And he'll be the reigning king of kings and Lord of lords. God bless you as you go. Have a great week.